This is our final session of the conference, and it's my great pleasure to see on the stage Roland McCready, Diane McCarty, Darvon Maté, Sherry Ona Menzan Sills, Gerald Pollack, Robert Lever, Catherine O'Clair, and Bessel van der Koop. Now, um, I've been given lots of questions, and I'm trying in some way to sort out questions, and I'll get through as many as I can. If I don't reach your question, uh, it's not personal, but I'm just trying to figure out which questions might be of interest to a number of the panelists. And I think this is a, a question perhaps to more the clinicians here uh, in the, on, the, on the panel. And the first question is, what would you tell yourself or a past patient you didn't manage correctly, knowing what you know now? <laughs> and I wonder, I'm going to just keep that open to anyone who wants to pick it up. And if somebody doesn't pick it up, I'll maybe choose someone. So who would like to start with that? Okay, I'm going to pick it up, and I'm just going to quote somebody instead. I learned this from a teaching assistant in Switzerland who happened to have a very, very difficult traumatic abuse history. And she made the statement about, and this is what happens when the practitioner goes into freeze. And I learned such a lot from that. And she taught me to notice when I go into freeze, around another person's history and to start to self-regulate around that. She taught me to recognize that moment. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the hardest... Question, I'm sorry, I just don't understand the question again. Is it what we would tell ourselves having made a mistake or not fully helped somebody and what would you tell us of in retrospect? Is that the question? Yeah, that seems to be the implication. What would you, what would you have done differently? I see, okay. Sorry. I think that my own evolution is that I used to believe that I had to fix people. And what really became slowly is discovering ways in which I can help people to... Um, gain ownership over themselves, and that I'm just a bystander who helps people find that ownership. And there's many different ways of doing it, and um, you have a limited, limited vocabulary, you use your vocabulary, and then when people don't respond, you either say, she's treatment resistant, or you say, I am learning resistance. And so the issue is that if you don't know how to help somebody, it's time to learn something new. Yeah. Robert? I think the thing to say is that um, if we're working conscientiously, we tend to do the best we can at the time, even if it's wrong. <laughs> we tend to marshal whatever knowledge and compassion, understanding, etc., to do the best we can. But I think it's important that the, the practitioner ego never grows to the point that we either swell with pride at our successes or get suicidal at our failures because it's incredibly human uh, to be flawed, uh, to, to have limitations. And I think that uh, it's an important lesson which we don't always grasp early on in practice, that we are going to do our best, but we won't always get it right. And there are probably hundreds of incidents answering the question when I might have considered doing things differently. But um, I don't remember too often having reflected on something and said, actually, that was such an abysmal failure, I should have known better. But uh, I think there are times when I've definitely reflected on my limitations in the past and uh, acknowledge them. And we, we all hope that we grow through, our, through a certain amount of self-examination and, and we go on growing and getting better, we hope. Hmm, thank you, Robert. Maybe just ask Wendy to pick up. Um, 
a couple of times this last year, uh, I had things happen with moms and babies that twice I felt really sorry that I had missed something. <clears throat> and first I dealt with what came up in me and uh, about that. But in both those situations, I felt it was really important to talk to the mom about it. So I would just say, you know, when this situation came up, I'm really sorry because I wish it could have gone this way or I had, you know, understood this more. And I just wanted to tell you that. And it ended up being really building trust moments and deepening in our relationship. So, um, yeah. I remember, um, I remember one case very um, vividly. It was decades ago. I was in family practice. And a, a patient of mine, a woman in her 60s, I had to admit her to hospital to work up for possible malignancy and um, we, we did a chest x-ray and um, I'd visit her and she asked what the x-ray shows I said well the, the scan hasn't come back yet and for a couple of days I'd visit her and she'd say what does the x-ray shows and I'd say well it, well it hasn't come back yet and the third morning I went in and she didn't ask me, but the scan had come back, and I said, I'm afraid that the news is not good. It's that there's cancer, it's in your lungs. And she said, why did you tell me that? I didn't ask you. She hadn't asked me that morning. Mm -hmm. And what I learned was, uh, in fact, I'm still learning, is not to give information and not to answer questions that people hadn't asked and not to give advice that people hadn't requested. I'm still learning that one. And she had asked, but not that morning. And she was so angry with me for having told her. And she was right. She hadn't asked that morning. And there was a reason why she didn't ask. She didn't want to know. And I'm just wondering, you know, isn't, isn't it always the case? I mean, do we ever get to a place where we just know everything that needs to be known um, in, you know, around humanity and how to relate to people? Isn't it an ongoing journey of discovery as much for the practitioner, whatever yeah. discipline we're doing, as it is for the client. Perhaps you can pick that up. Interesting question about, raises an interesting yep. question about um, patients' expectations. And I think it's, it's very wise if one can, as I say, rise above practitioner ego, which is a tremendous, um, uh, tremendously important thing to do but you also have to resist your patient's expectations of you. Yes. And if patients actually try and cast you in that role, yes. then you have an interesting job to do to uh, negotiate that yes. in all honesty. Yeah. Shariona. Well, I'm thoughts? still responding to the previous question, <laughs> but it kind of relates. Um, it's when I first heard the question, I thought, well, I'd need to be very PC about this answer because... I've really changed the ways that I work, and there's so many people who still work the way that I used to work. And then, um, kind of related to what you said earlier, Robert, you know, I, that I've changed the ways that I worked and used to work in different ways can also help me to have empathy and compassion for the developmental journey of, of a practitioner. And I've always believed and felt that um, we draw to us people who are a match in some way, you know, that, the, that field phenomenon, you know, they're attracted to what we have to offer. However, um, <laughs> with what I've learned, um, I feel like my deeper response, or a different response is to say, I'm really sorry that I didn't know yet how to slow down. And I'm really sorry that I was still living from the neck up and wasn't as in my body, so I didn't have that somatic reflection to offer you. And I'm really sorry that I allowed you to go falling into your trauma the way I had been taught to, um, instead of helping you to take little bits of it and to integrate in a slow, paced, mindful way that you could integrate. Thank you, and. And, 
<laughs> Thanks. And you know, when I do something wrong, which I, I don't often do things that I, I regret with clients, but if I'm aware of it, I really try to, to make repair, which is what I heard you talking about, Wendy. And that can be incredibly healing, perhaps more important and more helpful than if I had done it all correctly the first time. I'd like to say one more thing in relation to what you just said and the ego thing. Um, I think one of the hardest things I had to learn and my students is how important we are in our patients' lives. It doesn't mean it's very important, but they put everything they have into your heart and how much trust they put in you and how hard it is to know how vitally important whatever you do and whatever you say is for that other human being, actually. That you're much more important than you think you are because you know yourself you're not so important. And then suddenly in that relationship, you become, you become very important. Right. Very Catherine, did you want to say something else? No? no? Okay, you're done. Okay. Uh, here's another question. Um, and I think in this question, maybe I'm going to start with Roland, as you hadn't had a chance to be part of the last question. But it's a question I think a number of the panel can try to address. How does the panel view the significance of habit in the maintenance of patterns from both the physiological and psychological aspects. How okay. does the panel, I'll repeat, how does the panel view the significance of habit, 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 habit. in the maintenance of patterns, both physiological and psychological? Uh, well, personally, I would turn that around and say a habit is the sustained maintenance of a physiological and psychophysiological pattern. Um, they're synonymous. Um, and that there's no cha sustained change or growth without a shift in a, a, cha a change of the those fundamental baseline, what we call reference patterns in my flood. Um, I'm a prebrium, Carl Prebrium, uh, devo not devotee, but he was my one of my mentors. And uh, I've really come to, the more I've come to understand that, I'm going to go a little bit off topic here, but... Um, for me, in my own journey, it, it's really understanding how the brain works and the, the amygdalas and the importance, not just the amygdalas, but the importance of pattern and how that's sustained in our neural architecture really opened up another level of compassion for me, really understanding that. And it was really important in, in the evolution of our own interventions, if you will, and tools and techniques that that's really what we had to ultimately get at to help humanity was help them quickly, more quickly establish new reference patterns. So I could talk a lot more about it, but General, I'm sure a lot of people. Habit, habit uh, reminds me of uh, my, my encounter a couple of days ago with Rupert Sheldrake. I, I don't know how many of you know his ideas about, well, habit, uh, morphic resonance. And the idea is that, that anything that has happened once is easier to happen the second time because the information is is in the environment and of course it's a controversial kind of idea but but the question of the word habit reminded me of that because it's exactly habit because something has happened uh, uh, multiple times and it's easier for it to happen happen again I'm sure that if, if this theory is validated and he has quite a bit of evidence for it that it certainly can affect our physiology. Um, sure, Yona. I'd like to speak to the psychological aspect. That, and I, also, I tend to use the word habit and pattern in the same phrase. To me, they're basically the same thing also. Um, but what's of interest to me is that it seems to me that they keep us, whoever we are, in fear. They keep us in safe, familiar territory when we don't actually feel safe. And so I think that's just important to acknowledge. And often that's really helpful, just acknowledging that, being able to recognize it. Again, I, I find mindfulness really helpful just to have an awareness like, oh, I've done this before. Um, and that can be on really minute levels. And I'll come back to... I, I always come back to my dear mentor, Emily, 
And just to say, I learned something really profound about this when I saw her sitting on a chair. And she sat down on the chair and she realized she always sat on the chair the same way. So she got up and she sat down a different way. And I thought, ah, that's it. You know, that's what opens us up to what's really available in this moment. So you're alluding to the fact that habits actually serve a useful purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone it's want protective. to pick up on that? Well, yeah, Bessel. To my mind, this whole, this whole work is about changing patterns. Uh, when you're a somatic therapist, you change somatic holding patterns. When you're characterologically, uh, one of my favorite treatments is theater, where you get to play the role of somebody else and feel what it feels like to inhabit the body of somebody who plays a different role. When you do neurofeedback, you change your habitual neuronal patterns. Um, it looks like I'm going to be involved in the stage three trials of MDMA, of ecstasy, uh, psychedelic agents for a treatment of PTSD. Again, it opens up new patterns of understanding oneself in the world. That's really what, that's the work that we do on whatever level you're engaged with this. I think if we're discussing the topic of a habit, I'd love to bring Gabor in at this point. Um, thank you. Uh, well, the habit is another meaning, you know. It means clothing that you wear, like a monk's habit. And uh, the, it is something that we wear. The question is, do we do so consciously or unconsciously? So a lot of habits are good. Getting up and brushing your teeth in the morning, it's a good habit. Um, the Buddha had this wonderfully uh, unpleasant, frightening image of um, two strong men uh, dragging a third one, a weaker one, uh, into a fiery pit to his doom. And resist as he might, he just couldn't, um, couldn't protect himself. And the Buddha said, those two strong men are your habit energies. They're the uh, brain, if you put it in modern terms, um, they're the brain patterns that, that have been grooved a long time ago, if you like, by trauma, who then have you acting in the same negative ways. And the weaker mind, the weaker man, the one who's going to his doom, is the untrained mind. So it's a question of who's in charge. You know, if, as Bessel said about trauma, the essence of trauma, and I'm just, I was surprised to find out that that definition goes back to the 19th century, because um, th that the essence of trauma, or one aspect of it is, is that you can't be in the present moment. And so um, when you're not in the present moment, then you're governed by habit in the Buddha sense. You can also be in the present moment and have habits that are totally friendly and, and supportive. So it's a question of uh, mindfulness and somatic awareness in the present moment. Uh, that'll define whether a habit is helpful or harmful. Yeah, Robert, would you like to comment? I agree with that. I think the um, thing about habit, as you say, is that they can be benign or not. I mean, there are habits that are good. There are habits that are bad, there are habits that are plain revolting, there are all kinds of habits, but the point is to see them on a spectrum, I suppose, and I think to answer the question, it's absolutely crucial. I think a lot of the time, as Bessel was saying, what, what we're doing is we're, we're being brought by our patients or our clients, we're being brought uh, patterns that are ripe for change. and. Uh, it's recognizing the readiness of that individual to both desire change and to be prepared for it and to be able to know how best to support them through it. And I think that without that, then many, many of our chronic patients wouldn't, wouldn't get very far with the work that we do with them. So I would say that to answer the question, it's absolutely vital to our thinking. If I can follow the question on a little bit, um, perhaps we could say a habit is any situation where we've lost options. You know, we've lost options of which direction to go or which how to function. And uh, as I think, Sherry Ona, you alluded to, um, 
the work is all about helping to rekindle those options or bring those options back to the forefront. And I'd like to ask the question, maybe in a general sense, but how, how do you find yourselves most able to re-establish this sense of option for the people who you're working with? Catherine, yes. I think for me, what's kept me in this particular modality, which was the thing that didn't manage to uh, make me stick to a straight osteopathy, was that we have a far more personal connection with our clients through our very profound relational touch. And in that, you can always see the jewels in the middle of all the dross. You can actually see the radiance of the person in that, in a way, much simpler and much more honest connection that we make. Yeah. Anyone else? Shariona? I feel like there are probably 21 ways I could answer that question, but I'll <laughs> stick with one. Um, since it's um, a biodynamic conference, I feel like I want to speak to what happens when things change at a deep level in biodynamics, where um, the system's been able to settle deeply enough that the holistic shift can happen and primary respiration comes to the fore and potency begins to do, to choose what it wants to work with. And it finds an inertial fulcrum, an area that it, it wants to work with, and um, it, it does its work. And then things are very different. And I think about the effects of that. Um, and I, I come back to a client that I had years ago who, I, I can't remember actually what the physical ailment was that, um, he came to me for, I think it was a back issue, but that seems quite irrelevant right now. But what he told me is that, this was in California, he lived in a little apartment, and he'd been living in terror for years that his landlord would someday come to the door and open up the door and go, what a mess, you have to get out of here, you're, you're evicted. Because he was such a hoarder, he would, um, he had piles, the way he described it, piles of papers everywhere. So he'd walk in the door, and there was a narrow little passageway to get through all the piles. And when he came back the next week, he told me that he'd been trying to clean this up for years and just hadn't been able to. He came back the next week and told me that he had just felt this impulse to start cleaning when he got home. <laughs> and he, clean, he stayed up all night, cleaned up the whole apartment, tossed everything out, and the, the um, landlord he'd been so afraid of had never actually knocked on the door before, but came to the door the next morning <laughs> and, you know, opened the door and said, oh, what a beautiful, clean apartment. <laughs> now, that's a change in habit, right? Sure. Yes. That, and, and it's coming from a change in physiology, in, in how things are held or not held energetically. Will you offer me a session? <laughs> Your wife would appreciate it. <laughs> so, so I'm just thinking, what, what, what would be the prerequisites, though, for helping to put us back in touch with these options where movement and change can happen? What are the prerequisites? How do you view this? I think this question can be open to almost anyone on the panel. Bessel, yeah. I think you always need to know the options yourself. And so before you inflict your particular treatment on anybody else, <laughs> inflict it upon yourself and see how you respond to it and what it does for you. And never inflict a treatment on other people that doesn't, hasn't worked for you. Uh, that's where you start. So, uh, Roland, you want to? Oh, Wendy, Wendy, please. Um. That's, this is one of the things that I loved when I got using EFT and some of the other energy psychology uh, tools was um, we really, I mean, sometimes it's wonderful to think about what would you really like if this was healed, you know, and, and for them to say, wow, I'd really like to feel at ease doing this or something. And, and that's then an option or visioning it. 
But often <clears throat> what happens is, you know, when we recognize what is and we be with it and we name it and we do a process like this and the whole system changes, the physiology, the emotional, mental, I think non-local. So the whole being changes and in that moment that often that's where the options emerge organically. And that's, I call it, that's where the magic happens. You know, it's, it's still, it, like in uh, biocranial work, you know, where a new pattern emerges, uh, you know. So um, options emerge that we might not see at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. yeah Roland, please. I'm not sure what the question was anymore. <laughs> But we're certainly talking a lot about patterns and habits and how do you change them seems to be the general topic. And I know that for me, I have to kind of be somewhat careful of language here because pattern can be the pattern of tissue. You know, if, um, if we breathe as a pattern, you know, that's a, you could call that a habit. Maybe breathing is a habit, but I think it's more of a, you know, a physiological pattern reference. But the way we, so, um, I'm going to get a bit philosophical here, I guess. I think it would scare most people if they really could look at the end of a day on a computer readout, how much of their thoughts, emotions, behaviors, and actions were automatic and automated. And just even those so-called intelligent, enlightened sort of people. So much of, I'm serious, because a lot of people think, oh, I'm so aware, but still when it really gets down to it, so much of how we behave, think, and respond is unconscious, and it's to do with these in, these patterns that we have in our, in our neural architecture. And, you know, it's hard to know what we don't know sometimes. And so it's really the first step is self-awareness and looking under the radar uh, a bit. And that can take some effort and be scary. And most people don't want to do that because you have to expend some effort to do that. But it's still the first step, um, really looking under the the hood a little bit deeper. And uh, Bezel talked about some of the neural structures involved in that, but it is the, the frontal systems. And then it's, as we start to then intervene, uh, and it may be simple things like, I don't know, you get pissed off in traffic when you get cut you know, in the traffic jams and you say, well, wait a minute, that's not gonna make your traffic move any faster, I'll turn the radio on, I'm gonna self-regulate, I'm gonna choose something different. It's that, and repeating that is how you state new patterns. I don't know if I'm making sense to you guys, but that's how we, you know, I'm just using traffic jams literally and figuratively there. But it is, um, philosophically from my perspective, it's sort of an inner prompter we develop that can come in that, that really is about raising the vibrational rate of our consciousness. Again, on my view, it's literally a higher sample rate. You know, so time changes and we have more time to intervene in the, the, you know, the stimulus and response. Um, I talked a little bit about that in my presentation, but anyway, so I probably said enough here. Thank you, thank you. So this next question, I'm gonna start with Gerald on this, um, but I do think it's a question that could be picked up by other panelists. Do you think the water in our bodies can hold our memories or even be part of our mind. Our mind. Well, if, if one um, roughly equates our mind with our brain, which is not so clear, um, then uh, the, the neurons are cells like every other cell. And if other cells are able to hold memory, then, then we would expect that brain cells could, could do the same. So. You know, when it comes to, uh, to memory, there are a few things to say about it. The first is a, a bit building on, on what I presented, um, that the water has a huge capacity for storing information, and that this revelation is, is coming again and again uh, from people worldwide who are studying it, and, and the reason for it is, is, is that the easy water has structure to it, it's like a crystal, and as a crystal, it has the capacity to store information. Uh, local changes in crystal structure represent information, and it's not so different 
really from a computer memory that you, you stick in the, into your laptop, uh, your thumb drive that has a capacity to store information. And uh, it, it may well be that, it, that in the future, that our memory sticks will actually contain easy water. This would not be a, a big surprise. And if so, we've got easy water all over in our brains, our minds, and every, every cell of our body. And uh, the information is now being used clinically, actually, to, to, to improve health. And um, at, at our annual conference, people come and discuss this. So one, one of the interesting uh, discussions has come from Luc Montagnier. Some of you may know he won the Nobel Prize for, for discovering HIV. Well, he was a friend of Jacques Benveniste, who, who got into big trouble when he claimed that water had memory. However, his experiments uh, have been repeated and confirmed. And when Jacques died, Luc t took over because he thought this had huge potential in terms of medicine and, um, and, and cures. And he's developing this right now. And his information, which, which is rather controversial, um, he, his basic experiment is to take some DNA and put the DNA next to water. And he claims that putting the two together, there's no, no chemical transfer between the two, just proximity. He says that the information from the DNA is, is coming and being stored in, in the water. And then he uses that water to create new DNA by so-called PCR reaction and this water has the information, and the new DNA has the same sequence as the original DNA that was sitting next to the water. A lot of people don't believe it, um, uh, but uh, he claims that it's been repeated by, uh, by several groups, and he's now using this uh, in, in a, a clinical sense. So uh, the, the answer to your question from the evidence that I've seen is yes, uh, we're, we're full of information, the water in our bodies uh, contains information, and this information may be extremely fundamental uh, in in governing the governing the the function of our body. This is we're we're just at the at the fundamentals of uh, beginning to uncover the fundamentals of this process. And my prediction is that in 20 years or 30 years, the, this kind of information will dominate uh, uh, science. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Robert. Thank you for that. That was, that was lovely. I think if we um, re remember the relationship that we were talking about water has to the um, extracellular matrix and to the connective tissue matrix, then uh, we may be back in the realm of uh, what we were talking about before, and that is um, habit, in that the um, confirmation of proteins may be affected in such a way that it's reflected in the um, structural balance of the body. And there again, that we know that structural balance is very often reinforced by and created by uh, habits, variations in uh, function, posture, movement, and the many things that can affect it on all kinds of planes, psycho-emotional planes too, which can have a profound influence on the way we use our bodies in all kinds of ways, the ways we relate to the world and express ourselves. So I wonder if the water is a vitally important part of that larger matrix, which, as Gerald was saying, will be hopefully be more and more seen as a fundamental part of um, the kind of science that we need to understand our uh, physical and physiological habitus a little bit more clearly. Mm. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Catherine. Well, of course, the fluid body... Is this on? Yes. The fluid body is like a major motif in craniosacral therapy and craniosacral biodynamics. And so much of our work is going back to Sutherland and reading the nuances of the tide. So it's all about recognizing ordered tidal motion and disorganized fluid motion in the body, which arises around the historical patterns which are generated around the inertial sites. So, of course, this is like our bread and butter in many ways. Yeah, reading the stories in fluid 
or in water. Yes, sure I can just that. tag on to that, that um, it's something that I experience with cranial work and also with continuum is that we dissolve, as I was saying yesterday. And so when we're in what Emily called the cultural anatomy, our everyday state, we're in a more solid state. We're less watery. And so we tend to be more in habit and we have fewer options. We're more rigid and less resilient. When we start to dissolve and come into that fluid body, um, we have more options. And so we're less in habit and there is more uh, opportunity for health and creativity and resilience and all of that, things can change. Thank you. This next question is, uh, it's addressed to Garbor and Bessel, but I think again it can be picked up by others. How do you foresee this information and awareness about attachment, attunement, reaching en masse En masse, meet, reaching the general population. And then there's something I'm not quite clear how to read. But how can, that, how can this information go out? How do you see the, this uh, reaching a wider audience? Gabo. First of all, we have to look at why is it even necessary for it to reach a wider audience? Because when you look at... Um, Aboriginal cultures in their natural state, they understand everything about attachment. Without any theory of attachment, without probably even a word for, without even a word for it. It's just simply what human beings do. It's what animals do in their natural state. It's what chimpanzees do, it's what cats do, it's what even rats do. Not even, but including rats do. So the real question is, well, what has happened to make us so alienated from our own nature that now we have to have information brought to us intellectually that our gut senses actually should tell us, but we're so cut off from ourselves. In other words, as a society and a culture, we're so traumatized, because that's the other aspect of trauma, is being disconnected from yourself. Uh, why are we so traumatized as a culture? So the real question is, how do you uh, deal with the trauma that's so general in this culture? Yes. So that's the first point. Um, the, the second point is, um, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, Bessel in his book, as, as doing my own, uh, we, we refer a lot to the great adverse childhood experiences studies uh, done by Vince Felitti and Robert Anda. Uh, you know, these are the studies that uh, show the impact on addiction, mental health issues, autoimmune illness, criminal behavior, attachment problems of early childhood adversity. These studies were, and if you're not familiar with these studies and if you're working with people, just tonight look them up, easily available on the net, adverse ACE studies, seminal studies. They were done uh, generated in the Kaiser Permanente system in California where Vince Felitti, the, one of the lead investigators, was a clinician, internal medicine specialist. Three years ago, four years ago, I was invited by Kaiser Permanente in San Diego, which is where the studies originated in California, to present on addiction. And about a month before the conference where I was to speak, they called me up and said, well, could you send us some literature that supports your, your, you know, your conclusion that addiction is trauma-related? I said, yes, that these days studies from your organization in California, the Kaiser Permanente, they said, really? And when I came to the conference and I asked how many people had heard about these studies, less than half of them had. This is in the organization that generated the studies. And um, now it's shifting somewhat, the fact that so many people are here. Uh, Bessel is here at another trauma conference here in uh, London. I know, lo and behold, three weeks ago I spoke to the Massachusetts Medical Society in Boston. You know, I mean, this is unheard of. 
uh, that, that physicians are finding. But it's so slow. It's like molasses still. And as Bessel pointed out in his talk today, the resistance is still intense to the point of denial. So um, how to do this? We just keep doing it. We just keep doing it. But I think that the pressure is going to come from the outside and not because the institutions of this society are, like the institutions of any society, are designed to keep things exactly as the way they are. And if, Brit if the British government, for example, actually understood trauma and its impact and all the streams that flow into the torrent of trauma that, are, that, 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 that has overcome this society, everything would have to change. Their social policy would have to change, their educational policy would have to change, their medical system would have to change, uh, economic considerations would have to have no different priorities and all that. In other words, the resistance is built into the system and uh, I just see slow, ongoing, um, but increasingly exciting work being done, the fact that say Bessel's work is now so well known internationally, is a sign that people are reconnecting to the essence of things, but that's happening more outside the official institutions and, and governmental structures than, than inside. And as to how to change the latter, I think it's going to take a long time. That's my particular view. Yeah, Bessel, please. I'm actually astounded and continuously preoccupied that there are two parallel worlds. And this is world, assume that you guys belong to, of people who are curious, who are into attachment, who are into seeing how things are interrelated. And in my lifetime, I see a vast explosion of that world. And it's magnificent. And that's the world that I live in most of the time, let's say 51% of the time. Um, and many of you also. And it's exciting, and you see great developments. Parallel to that, is Trump. <laughs> <laughs> and all that stands for. And uh, so many Trump-like phenomena on this world. And like, how do these things live side by side with absolutely, just as we're beginning to talk about in America, parental leave for mothers. Uh, John Hackman won the Nobel Prize showing that for every dollar that you invest in early child mother in interventions, society in the long range harvests seven dollars. I think people in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland and all those places really read that and said, oh, maybe we should actually make it possible to help mothers raise their kids and be there and all sorts of stuff. In America, died. Uh, only lazy people need to be helped to raise their kids. Like, and we have these parallel universes. And here's another parallel universe. You spoke to the Massachusetts Medical Society. I spoke to the British Columbia Medical Society. Wow, that wasn't but, to me. But you will never get invited <laughs> to the British Columbia yeah. Medical Society. I'll never get invested to the yeah. medical <laughs> master because nobody listens to any prophets. Who you home. spoke to the BCMA? Yeah, I think so. That's yeah. when? <laughs> no, that, but that's the world that we live in. If you are local, you know, cannot be any good. That's great. Uh, that's really great. <laughs> so, so, so we live in these weird worlds, you know, of people adoring certain people. And then, and then uh, a statue of Nelson, Nelson Mandela, the best trauma therapist I ever saw, was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. It's just stunning. And everybody says, he was the noblest man who ever lived. And then, um, these forces, anybody who's into the history of trauma discovers these forces. So the, the whole issue of trauma was thoroughly understood by 1895. People nailed it. Uh, five years later, everybody who's into trauma gets fires from every hospital in the world that does this sort of stuff. And you see these cycles over and over again of something getting revealed, Open. How did it happen? God knows. Mm. And as you know, just sorry to take so much time, perhaps, but just one more quick comment about Trump. I mean, what you have here, and I'm sure you'll agree, is a prime example of a highly traumatized person. 
I, I mean, I, I, Trump is a highly traumatized oh. person. Every time he opens his mouth, he's he, my he, poster he manif child. He manifests so, trauma. Like, his trauma his desperation for attention, his, uh, aid, his difficulty concentrating, mm -hmm. his uh, poor impulse control, his um, need to dominate women, his uh, grandiosity, these are all compensations for severe trauma. And we know he was traumatized. His father was a rageaholic, uh, verbally uh, emotionally abusive person. One of his brothers drank himself to death. Or you take a Tony Blair. You know, I mean, the degree of disconnect it takes not to feel any remorse for having killed 400,000 human beings, the de degree of disconnect that it takes not to recognize it, he's got to be a traumatized person. And these are the people that lead our societies. Mm. That's the reality. And, and that's because our societies are so traumatized. So, um, on the one hand, there's this huge ground swell of interest and enthusiasm for this work and attachment work and trauma work, which is really great and gratifying to see. On the other hand, that's the structure that keeps it going. Mm. Yes, Catherine. So I'm actually wondering, Bessel, whether that division is simply between the people who are willing to actually stand up and face their own suffering and those who aren't. I think a very big thing is the ability and the conditions to be self-aware. And what I also think is true is that if there is relatively little trauma, people have the opportunity to become self-aware. So the awareness is a function of society being in good shape. In my field, uh, one of the countries that have contributed most to our literature, Norway, Holland, Australia, all these places that are sort of idyllic little places where relatively little occurs. But nothing comes out of India because there's such massive suffering that you cannot even begin to start beginning to peel things out in a way. And so you need to have very good social conditions in order to begin to, to get there to become self-aware. And what is so worrisome for me about America is that I went to medical school at the University of Chicago and I found the, the area I lived in is the most dangerous area I've ever lived in. Since that time I've traveled all over the world, that area of, of Chicago is still the most dangerous area I know of, and nothing has changed. Uh, and so at the end, it is a political issue. Uh, it's about politics. And it's about who, how we organize ourselves. God knows how to do that. Yeah, Sheriona, and then I'm going to just uh, complete, I think, with a question to each of the panel, the same question. Come, Sheriona. Um, to me, this conversation comes back to habit, pattern, and memory. And I, I realized earlier, um, I used the word habit when I meant to use the word memory. And so I realized, thinking about that, they're actually very connected. But, you know, you're, you're speaking about a polarity, you know, there, there was a very different kind of president in the U.S. until recently. And so then, whoom, you know, people go back to um, a very traumatized kind of habitual way of being. You know, they come back to the place that they feel safe in, where they don't feel safe, you know, where there is no safety. And so you, you, what I'm thinking about, and actually what I meant to say earlier, is that there are different kinds of memory there's the memory, uh, the traumatic memories, um, the memories of things that are difficult for us, that we hold onto tightly and often unconsciously that can really direct us in our lives. And then there are the other memories. And in biodynamics, it's, it would be the memory of the biodynamic forces, the health, you know, the, the original potential. We can come back to that um, and often that takes awareness, so coming back to self-awareness. But where you've had someone, um, for example, the last US president, it was actually in his body, I think. You know, I actually felt safe with him because I could, I could believe what he was saying um, because I could read his body. And so the reaction to that 
is some of us going, oh, thank goodness, and others going, oh, we got to get rid of that, you know, slam, mm. closing things down to a further extreme. It's a polarity bouncing back and forth, which is a habit. Mm. It's coming back to the familiar. So I'm more thinking, reaction to what you're saying, and that is, in, from the animal literature, we know that if you raise animals in a very adverse circumstances, not a group of animals in nice circumstances, you put them all together, and then you create low stress in that colony. The animals that grew up in adverse circumstances go back to where they grew up. The animals who grew up under safe circumstances go back where they grew up. And so habit is critical, and so people go back to what's familiar over what is safe. And I think that's where the work of many of you come in, of working with the body. Because once the body becomes aware of what it feels like to be safe, I think you break those habits. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very visceral, body-based experience. And to my mind, that's why the body work is, in, to a large degree, the foundation of change. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bessel. So I think we're going to finish with this question, and the question comes in a few different parts. Um, and it might be nice just to go down the line to see, uh, to hear what each person has to say. What in your experience has been or is your most valuable resource to negotiate safety, to feel connected to your body or to a practitioner or as a practitioner? The question's not clear. Maybe I can just rephrase. What, in your experience, has been your most valuable resource to negotiate safety, safety, feel connected to the body, or to be a practitioner? Roland, perhaps you could start with that. <laughs> I don't think it's fair, but I'm going first on that one. Um, I'm tired of to ponder it. Well, I could... I really can't answer that in one word, and that's intuition for me, and which is aligning with, it took, didn't just happen magically in a certain way. That was uh, through practice and vulnerability in a certain way, and, and really uh, letting, my, I won't say ego, cause, but mind, uh, and wanting things the way I wanted it to actually surrender to another deeper part of myself that uh, and allow that to be the really the source of inner guidance, which is really what guides our research and our whole, actually our whole organization to a certain degree. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's Wendy. A big question. Um, I really live and breathe the wholeness, coherence, and right relationship and the transcendent and, and human self. And I really do feel safe when I feel aligned with the more of who I am. And intuition's right in the middle of that, right, uh, that channel of communication. But also it's my spiritual practice too, uh, of, of, of being grounded in who I am in this moment, both as a human being and as a spiritual being. Uh, there's a grander hold that, that holds me. It, you know, it's like what I was saying today about being embraced by that. Um, and that's, that's a way of life for me. Thank you. Gabo. Well, the, the question is the most significant one. I mean, I could talk about yoga, which I discovered recently. You know, there's such a thing as yoga. I don't know if you know this. <laughs> but I learned this uh, five months ago, and it's made quite a difference in my life. But um, the biggest thing, actually, are to the people sitting in this room, my daughter and my wife. Um, and it's the, particularly my spouse, uh, we've been together, married 48 years almost, and uh, <laughs> you'll forgive me. Uh, the, as the joke goes, on our 47th anniversary, we raised a glass of wine and we thanked each other for five good years of marriage, you know? <laughs> and uh, uh, mean, mean, meaning to say that there's been a lot of struggle, but the struggle has been for self-knowledge. And if, if, I had, if I had one, I mean, there's many ways that I've learned in many different places and sources, but 
it's been that necessity to become present in a relationship uh, and therefore finding out what keeps you from being present and what keeps me in my habits, what keeps me in my reactivity um, and the necessity to move beyond that. That's been my, and, and then, you know, to significant degree, my children as well. So that's been my greatest school and that's, if I had to single out one experience, it was in that personal realm that I've had to do the work which then informs so much of what I do out there in the world. Thank you. Sherry I'm not quite sure how to sum this up. Um, <laughs> it's been a long journey to actually feel resourced. And um, I, so I'll, I'll say a few things. One is, um, I feel very grateful that I spent 14 years intensively um, doing Vipassana meditation and, and going on 10, 20, 30 days re retreats where the only thing I would do is observe my breath and sensations, uh, observing how they would change and learning to be, as we say, equanimous about that, not, not really caring. Um, <laughs> it was all equal. And that has stayed with me as a reassurance that whatever may be going on right now is going to change. But to me, that's also about fluid body awareness. That's fluidity, that everything changes. And so the, the journey continued, and I won't name everything that I did, but um, the process of coming into my body so that I could be aware in the present moment of change uh, a big piece of that was the pre and perinatal work, years and years. The reason I have a PhD in pre and perinatal psychology is I needed to do all that work. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that I believe that generally is the source of most issues. Um, and, and a few people here have said that, you know, conception or certainly before birth. And if you manage to get to birth without having issues, probably something happens at birth. Um, and, you know, there are lots of other things that happen in our histories. But for me, um, that was a huge piece that enabled me, I mentioned earlier, to come through the anesthetic fog of my birth and to start, well, to, to deepen my ability to really be present with myself and therefore with others and to self-regulate. I could go on, but <laughs> I think that's the core. For me, it's, um, it's uh, finding the truth. Um, finding the truth, uh, this is a, a quest that I've been on during my whole career. And, um, and, and somehow, um, when you discover something or find something that squares with your experience, it, it confers, at least for me, a sense of security that I, I can really understand what's, what's going on in, in this world. I've been doing this uh, in most of, most of my career. I, I spoke today about water, but before that, I worked in the area of muscle contraction, how, how the proteins of muscle come together to produce force and, and, and shortening. You know, in, in that field too, there, there's a pre prevailing idea, and it comes locally from um, Sir and the late Sir Andrew Huxley, had been uh, president of the Royal Society, knighted by the Queen, master of Trinity College, Cambridge, etc. A very, very distinguished man. And unfortunately, his theory didn't fit the evidence. And, and it was, I spent 20 years or 25 years doing experiments and trying to figure out what did fit the evidence. And as it all came together, and the, this, this road was, was uh, a difficult <laughs> road to to travel, as you, as you might guess, things began to, to gel, to, to come clear. And that sense of, of coming to, to um, what I, I, I feel, felt, and still feel is the truth, conferred a, a sense of, of security in me because I could finally understand how, how the world worked. So it was uh, in the muscle contraction field, and, and I presented about water. And, and the next subject, the book that I'm writing, is the same. And, and I felt 
in, as each one of these chapters in, in the new book came together, it, um, how do I describe it? A, a sense of uh, uh, satisfaction, a, a sense of really coming to understand reality. There are simple things that we don't understand that it's impossible that we don't understand them. For example, you know, you're sitting on a chair and you're glued to the chair, and oh, that's gravitation. So what's the cause of gravitation? Uh, if a 10-year-old asks you the question, uh, why does the ball drop? Well, what do you say? And you say, well, you know, masses attract. But then they'll ask you a question, well, why do masses attract? <laughs> you know, and you're stumped immediately. And the physicists are stumped too. And it's, for me, incredible that what we experience from moment to moment still is not understood. I have some ideas. I think they're really simple. And, and the next book uh, is, and, and, but I, what I really meant to answer the question is that the sense of satisfaction that you get in, in coming forth what you see as a, a real understanding, a clarity, an understanding of how the world works. The same with the earth spinning. Uh, maybe you never asked the question, how come the earth keeps turning? Maybe you did ask the question. I, I'm not sure, but um, the, 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 the first couple of chapters in, in, in the new book ad address that question. It's so important, but yet we, we never think about it. For me, this is the essence of uh, a sense of satisfaction and well-being, understanding progressively how the world works. Thank you. Uh, I can't wait to read the book because I've always wanted to know how the, why the world was spinning, actually. <laughs> it's just as well it is, I suppose. Yeah. Um, there's something in what everybody said that finds an echo with, with me and I suppose with my answer to this. Um, when I wrote my uh, first book, which I call it The Still Point of the Turning World, everyone thought it was a strange title. They wondered if it had to do with Andrew Taylor Still, who founded osteopathy. I said no. They wondered if it was about still points, which we use in our work. I said, not really. There are some echoes in it. In 1936, the poet T.S. Eliot was walking in a very fine house called Bert Norton in the Cotswolds with his lady friend and it was in those gardens as he walked that he was led to contemplate um, mortality and time and it caused many of the um, thoughts uh, in him to emerge to discuss these very strange and intangible ideas and he wrote this poem which is a very long poem called Bent Norton which you'll be relieved to hear I'm not going to recite to you <laughs> <laughs> but there were five or six lines in it, which I used to recite to my students at the end of a lecture series that I used to do. And I could never get to the end of it without feeling my eyes welling up. And as it happened, I used to say to them, uh, yes, I'm moved, Be not because Eliot says in five lines what I've been trying to say in 18 hours to you lot, but because there was something so profoundly uh, apposite and moving about it. And what it really did was it, it brought me and brings me closer to a, a, a very acute sense of the stillness in myself that I feel I need to find from time to time. And I certainly feel when I'm working, if I can find it, then I feel I can um, better serve my patients and do my work more correctly. And it's a very hard thing to define. I think uh, I used to once say that the, the nearer you get to truth, the more you run out of language. And I think it's very, very difficult to find the words to explain some of these notions, sensations, um, ideas that seem in a way to place you in a, a slightly better place, either to understand a little better or to orientate to your chosen path a little better. Whatever it is, it remains a supreme mystery, but I'm glad that I have a whiff of it now and again. And that's what Eliot's five lines encapsulate for me. I'd actually have to, I'd have to get the book out to do it, I'm sorry. But, uh, but uh, it begins at the still point of the turning world, and it also uses the phrase about the way that people interact, and he calls it he says, that's where the dance is. It's where the dance is. 
and he ends by saying, there is only the dance. And that's the end of the quote that I like to use. But it made me want to use the word dance a lot in the way that I describe the way we work with our patients, the interactivity of it, the compassion. What May Wan Ho sometimes used to refer to as quantum jazz, the idea that everyone's doing something slightly different, but the blend and the, the coalescence that can come around can be really very beautiful and very harmonious. So I lucked out. I was born at a very dark time in European history to parents with horrific histories, with horrific histories, and yet I never lost sight of the fact that joy was my birthright. That's it. <laughs> I'm very moved by what every, everything that everybody has said, and I think it's all very according to the truth. I particularly like the notion of vipassana meditation and being still and accepting in yourself whatever comes up. It's a very important part of the whole thing. I love the curiosity and trying to find out where things work. But there's another thing to the curiosity. And that's, maybe you're alluding to, to it also, is companionship in your curiosity. There really is nothing more fun than to do a project with somebody who you enjoy working with to discover things and to um, have a bunch of students and a bunch of collaborators and to jointly come to an answer. And I think the process, and maybe that's what you also talking about the process of jointly solving puzzles and uh, putting very complex collaborations together is spectacular. It's just great. And then one last thing, and that is um, little things of, of I, I like to put it on the competence, that there is something you do that where your body becomes to rest, playing the piano, uh, sewing, uh, gardening, something where you just create something not for other people. Like, I'm a really very bad pianist, but if I really want to have a good time, I play my Mozart sonatas. Please don't come visit me because I'll be embarrassed. <laughs> but it is heaven to just say, that is just such beautiful music, and it comes out of my fingers more or less when I do it. <laughs> Thank you. So here we are. This is a conclusion of our weekend. Please join me in just expressing deep thanks, deep gratitude to this extraordinary, wonderful, human, relational group of people with their depth of knowledge, depth of experience, and uh, just with such beautiful skills to communicate that depth. We so appreciate you. Thank you for coming. Paul and Jane, and uh, I mean, I know it's so much work, and thank you for, for doing it yet again, and hopefully we'll see you in a few years um, for this, and also thanks to all of the people who helped. I know it's a lot of work. So thank uh, you. Much appreciated. It's thank amazing. You. And to all of you. I know there's... We, we, we can't leave the room without some just further words of appreciation. Just huge appreciation to all of you for coming. And we are so touched. Uh, some of you have managed to make it here from, you know, two or three miles down the road. Others of you have come from, I mean, just, I can't even name the countries. And if I do start naming them... You know, other, I'll forget others, but just from all around the world, people have come to be here and to be part of this.
gathering and part of this exchange. And just such huge, huge thanks for making the effort. Uh, and it's, uh, we really hope that we, we have some further ways to share our experiences. Thank you. Thank you.